Hello again. Thanks for joining us on Celebrating Act Two. As you can see, Art Kirsch and I are with the lovely Dr. Liz Lister. Dr. Liz, great to see you again. Likewise, thank you. Dr. Liz, um, a, a lot of people in our audience are interested in um, uh, cognitive decline. Uh, and, uh, you know, we forget something where our keys is at the beginning of dementia, Alzheimer's, so on and so forth. And we had a wonderful conversation with a, uh, a great friend of ours, a partner in, in certain ventures. Uh, uh, her, name, her name is Grace. And she uh, was talking about, she, she was coming into the studio and she said, you know, I want to speak to you about something. But when I got through the doorway, I forgot. I knew it walking into the <laughs> studio on the other side of the doorway. And she calls it, you know, a doorway syndrome. Uh, gotcha. Can you uh, talk a little bit about that? And does that indicate uh, uh, that uh, we're losing it all or just some of it? And uh, maybe some of the things that are, that are happening as you continue to study ways to uh, uh, make people feel more confident uh, uh, as they get older. Absolutely. As you said, this is a big concern on everyone's minds uh, of many ages, but really, I would say maybe after 40 or after 50, and it gets to be, like you said, a bigger and bigger concern. There is a very important difference between forgetting where you put your keys versus putting your keys in the refrigerator and not realizing that you did that. So there really are very important distinguishing factors. And if people are worried about their cognitive function, it's very important to get it checked out. The good news is that we are learning more and more that there are ways not just to slow down cognitive decline. Everyone assumes, I think a lot, most people at this point assume that Losing our cognitive brain sharpness as we get older is inevitable. Not true. Oh, that's good. Not true. That's good. Yes, that's very good news. Even better news, not only is it not inevitable, but it can actually be reversed. Really? This has been shown. Really? Yes. Wow. Yes. That's good. That's yes. wonderful. It is very good so news, pray, right? So pray, pray tell, it. are they pills? How do you reverse it? Right. Pray tell, well, you stop walking into walls? What is it? All right. Well, uh, what I wanted to share with you in particular on this topic is something called the Bredesen Protocol. Dr. Dale Bredesen, I'm sure some of the people listening will have heard of this doctor uh, and his co-author, Dr. Perlmutter. He's also very well known. They wrote a book called The End of Alzheimer's. And they developed a program. Now, as I mentioned, it's called the Bredesen Protocol. And that subtitle is The First Program to Prevent and Reverse Cognitive Decline. Very exciting. Very exciting. I'll say. The program, yes. So doing the program is not, it's not expensive, by the way. Uh, there's online, there's an online testing component. Uh, there's some blood testing that gets ordered as part of the doing the program. But what I wanted to share with you today is the basis of the program, because it's when you hear it, you'll say, oh, well, that's common sense. But what was such a amazing step that they took is to put it all together into a protocol. OK, and there are six six pillars to this protocol. So I thought I would share with you those six pillars. Does that sound all right? Yes, yeah, that, that would you. be wonderful. All right, again, like we said, you will not be shocked by any of these, but you know, maybe a couple of surprises here and there. However, the first few are things that we've talked about, and I think you will not be surprised, and I think our listeners won't be surprised. Uh, number one has to do with dietary changes. We've talked about this so much. So you want to do, for example, uh, <clears throat> ways of eating that induce fat burning. So intermittent fasting does this. Uh, eating healthy fats, right, like nuts, walnuts. You know, those little walnuts, when you open them out of the shell, they look like a little brain and they help the brain. Yes. 
That's right? interesting. They okay, do, so, yeah. Right. So healthy fats, less sugar, fewer inflammatory foods. Okay, these are all kinds of things that you would imagine to be true. And eating less processed food, eating less junk food. Uh, they, these are these are important. And so that's the first pillar is diet, what you eat. The second is exercise. Turns out, then we'll say a little bit more because one of the other pillars I'll get to in just a moment. But what I want to convey, and I talk about this all the time with my patients, is that exercise does not mean intense exercise and knocking yourself out at the gym. That's actually not a good idea <laughs> for other reasons. Okay, but keeping the body moving, keeping the blood circulating, very important. That's the second pillar is exercise. Yep, makes sense. Right, it does, it makes sense. The third, which again, we have talked about is sleep and sleep hygiene. Yes. Good restorative sleep. You know, you've seen like a street sweeper go down the street, those, those brushes that spin. Yeah. Yeah, and clean sure. as they, uh, yes, and clean as they go. That is what's happening in the body and the brain in particular while we sleep. Interesting. It is going under, it is going through a power washing while we're sleeping. So that's <laughs> very important. I like sleep, that idea. Yeah, mm -hmm. sleeping, sleep hygiene. Uh, the fourth, stress reduction. As much as possible. That's yeah. a tall order for many people. However, in any way that one can help do that for your own system, that is going to be helpful. And that is the fourth out of the six pillars. Yeah. And we've talked about that a lot uh, with yoga, meditation, things like that. So yeah. people can go back on your playlist and find out ways that you can approach that right. for sure. That's right. That's exactly right. The fifth has to do with brain stimulation. Brain stimulation. Now, I know, you know, playing Sudoku, that's my husband's favorite thing to do. I personally like the other types of games, word games, crossword puzzles. Uh, but he likes to do the Sudoku with the numbers. I tried it the other day. It was difficult. And he told me, he goes, that's not an introductory level Sudoku. So he made me feel better. <laughs> Okay, but okay, but I also want to share, and I think we've talked about this, is learning something new. And we've so, talked about we we yeah, we here yeah, have, we have yeah we've we did a segment on brain games. Do they help? Yeah. And on, for better or worse, a lot of those the studies of those brain games, what it shows is that you get very good at the game. And it doesn't necessarily translate over to other areas where your brain will be sharp. So yeah, when I, you get out of your comfort zone, I find that I, I've got to pay attention to something. Uh, also, something that I'm negligent in. I actually go to the gym quite often and do about an hour of cardio every day. But that's all I do there. I don't. I used to go over to the weight room, and I sort of well, I get the cardio done and read a book and things like that. But I know that when I go and I try something new that I have to think about. Yes. It's a whole different experience. Yeah. Yes, that's right. And mm. I believe we've talked about learning a new dance, learning a new form mm. of dancing. That's a particularly great challenge for the brain because it also integrates the balance center of mm. the brain when you learn a new style of dancing. So it could be something easy like line dancing or a, a, a nice, easy my favorite latest exercise is a very low key short videos of like a short Zumba class. Yeah. That's my personal favorite lately. So, so it doesn't have to be Argentinian tango where it we're not. Yeah, I was gonna, each other. John, I was going to say that we should sign up for tango. You and I go to Arthur Murray. Yes, indeed. Indeed. It's very fun. Another important aspect of brain stimulation is the social interactions. Oh, social yeah. connections, social interactions. We've talked about this. Okay, sure. but this is where it comes in in the Bredesen protocol and in reversing cognitive decline. Hmm, it's so, so important. And, and, and also a sense of purpose. That's another interesting aspect of it. And that's very stimulating to the brain. 
Wow. This is good stuff. Yeah, isn't that neat? And then the last one, the six out of six, is very interesting, and that is oral hygiene. Really? Hmm. Yes, that is the sixth pillar of the Bredesen Protocol. If you think about it, oral hygiene, you've got the microbiome in your mouth, and it is right next to the brain. True. And this is another theory that I definitely subscribe to this theory. I think that it applies to cardiovascular disease. The oral microbiome affects the body in very interesting ways. And this was partly what we saw in the pandemic when the virus was taking away people's sense of smell and taste. Yeah. It was because the mm. nasal cavity is literally right next to the brain, behind the eyeballs at the upper part of the, of the nasal cavity it, it, it's about that far from the brain. Wow, yeah. Okay, and so the oral cavity is directly, it's obviously connected to the nasal passage. Sure. That's why we were able to go from the, the swabs straight back in the nose uh, right. to be able to do oral swabs and still get the same information. It's all connected. And so that's also very important. So addressing all of these can not only slow down cognitive decline, but can even reverse it. Wow. Oh. Wow, isn't it? So imagine if somebody's got uh, signs of cognitive decline, uh, what we might call the early stages of Alzheimer's, and they start doing these protocols, they start making this part of their routine, they could actually slow it down and last longer. Yes. That's amazing. Yes, and it doesn't require a lot of cost to do this. Uh, people can read the book and follow the guidelines in the book. Sure. Uh, there are doctors who get trained in it and specialize in it. Uh, and then there are some doctors, this is where it gets, it can actually bump into a little bit of controversy uh, because some doctors who use the Bredesen protocol recommend particular supplements and there can be a cost to that. Mm. All right. So, for example, taking a good quality fish oil. We, we've talked about this for sure. Yeah. All right. So th there's, you know, a little bit of difference of opinion of exactly how to implement it. However, I when I was looking up information to share about this, what I found is that the annual cost of taking care of people with Alzheimer's ranges anywhere between a little over ten thousand dollars per person per year all the way up to $34,000 per patient per year. Well, that's so understandable, it's huge, yeah. It's it a huge cost yeah. uh, to our society. And uh, so it's worth seeing these other ways and other things that people can do that we can hopefully implement further in terms of a public health approach. Yeah. But it's certainly something that we want to address and that our listeners as individuals, I know, I mean, they're listening. You're listening to this. So that means you're interested in your health. Right. And uh, and you want to learn other things that you can do to influence. Even, you know, when genetics are only a third of your outcomes, two thirds are the choices that you make. That's a good point. Uh, Dr. Liz, uh, now, the, obviously, I would think everybody really needs to read this book if you're interested in it. Don't just start trying to do these six things off of this video. But I, I have the question is, is it necessary to do these protocols under a doctor's supervision? That's a great question. I honestly would say that it's not necessary to do that. The only thing I would say is that if you already have a concern of as far as your cognitive function, then get checked out. That I would say. All right, and there is a part of the protocol, which of course is near and dear to my heart, that talks about the hormone balance and how it affects the brain sharpness. Yeah. We've, yeah, we've, we've talked, talked about, about this. That. Thyroid, estrogen, testosterone, they do talk about those hormones. And uh, so if someone needs help with that, of course they'll, they'll need a doctor's help with that. But you can make these dietary changes, you can, make the exercise changes, you can learn new things. These are all pieces of the protocol that you can implement that you don't require a doctor's supervision sure. necessarily. Yeah. yeah. And this is something you should do anyway. Right. Uh, to exactly. improve your health. Even if you don't have uh, Alzheimer's, you don't have 
uh, uh, cognitive decline, uh, particularly just helpful things to do. Sure. One thing I'd like to do, though, in, uh, before we uh, uh, wrap up, is that uh, we've discussed uh, this on several different occasions. Uh, and one thing I think that we all sort of <clears throat> recognize is that your general, uh, I call the GP, uh, the family physician, doesn't necessarily, they, although they're, they're learning more about it, but they aren't that knowledgeable in it. So they basically don't worry about it. You're you know, just getting a little old or forgetful. Mm -hmm. But if you really think you're having some issues, uh, what is the, the name of the kind of medicine or uh, doctor that you're looking for uh, if you really want to check out whether or not you uh, have something more serious than just minor, if you will, cognitive decline? Well, I would say either a neurologist. Neurologist is probably mm. the main person that would that would make the call if this is if someone is diagnosable with true blue dementia. Mm. They're also the experts with the medications that are uh, being used for that and the and the medication protocols. Uh, sometimes personality disorders will manifest or personality changes will manifest as mm. cognitive changes are occurring. And sometimes a psychiatrist will be involved in the diagnostic process. However, neurology and psychiatry is the same boards. It's the same medical board uh, that certify psychiatrists and neurologists. So there's definitely overlap there. Most people, Excellent. I would say, would would check with a neurologist. That would be the place where Excellent. they would have the testing uh, right at their fingertips as far as intake processes. That's what I would say. Great oh, information. By, by, by the way, there's so much going on in this field, so much that's being learned, so much that um, uh, helps us get on top of it, maybe delay uh, those onsets, yes. you know, those things. And uh, we thank you very much for because you're really on top of this because you're you're always you're always looking at things holistically for a patient. We know that, yeah. and it's not just well you, you have you know you have hot flashes. I'll help you with that. But, but taking a look at the entire thing because as we get older, one of the things about our audience is we live longer, healthier lives. Even if there are then we get more diseases because our parents and grandparents didn't die of dementia because they died when they were 55 and 60. Right, and, that's right. And uh, we, we have the, the, the double-edged sword of our audience is living into their 70s and 80s and well beyond. Yes. Yes. And so we're going to get these things, but there's all sorts of things that we can be aware of to help us get more enjoyment out of those later years as well. So we thank you for that. For more on Celebrating Act Two, visit our webpage, follow us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube, and tell your friends. Celebrating Act Two is the user manual for the second half of your life.